All right. Good evening, evening, friends. Stephen Benoom with Israeli News Live, and we have Brother Ron Gunter on with us. And um, Ron is also in LifeWave with us there, and uh, he has had some amazing testimonies. Won't be getting into that tonight. We're going to be talking about some very interesting events that he's had. And uh, now I've actually got to talk to him pretty deep on a lot of issues that he's gone through in life, some experiences that he's had. Uh, but I'm going to leave it up to him on what he's willing to share. Um, I know we did have, we had him on a little while back. He's a little bit reserved on, well, he was a lot reserved on that one there. So who knows? Maybe he'll go a little deeper tonight with us. Uh, I think it's interesting mainly because, Brother Ron, we're living in a day right now. It's not even funny. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you while, while we're right here on the air as well. You know, I did the message and uh, we were is actually in our teaching that we did last week. You weren't there, but I just posted it on um, on the YouTube channel finally. And when I it was on Patreon to start with for a few days. Then I posted it on our YouTube channel, and I think it's around 80,000 views right now. And um, the way I titled it, which normally doesn't matter how you title a video on the Antichrist, it doesn't really get views because of the way you title it. Somebody's got to like it and share it to get the views. And I think that's what's happened because I titled it, and now you know... Uh, who the Antichrist is, and uh, and and I and so I went and I re-listened to the whole video when I started going going viral, and I thought, what did I say that was so interesting in that video? <laughs> so <laughs> so I went back and listened to it, and uh, and then I realized I do I do get to that point where I finally do say, you know, now you you should know who the Antichrist is because it has a lot to do with the building of the third temple. Well, as I got into that. And then I begin to think today about the beast as well. And I'm still in the middle of study on this. But the very interesting thing is, is that the beast, the Antichrist, um, identifying them, is a lot easier than what we realize. Even the mark of the beast. So many people have been wondering, Brother Ron, about the mark of the beast. Oh, yeah. And um, I think I may even, at least I, I, will, I will tell you this much, I know where it's going to come from. What they'll actually use, I don't know for sure. But just like Antichrist is a false or a replica of the true Messiah, the true Christ, the true, because it comes from Mashiach. It's an anti version of the Mashiach. It is a false version of the Mashiach. So if you're going to have a mark of the beast as well, then I think the mark itself has to be a replica of something that at one time was genuine. And there was a mark given. That was during Jeremiah's days when they went to the city and he said, all of those that cry and sigh for the abominations that are done into the city, go put a mark on their forehead. And yeah. so I, I believe that what's going to happen is we're going to find out that people are going to get marked. But this is going to be the anti-type because it comes from the beast. So. You got marked in those days for those that stood for, notice that, those who really, if you think about it, those who stood for Israel got marked. The antitype, because the beast gets a hold of it, they're going to mark those who stand for Israel in this day. But the problem is it's not going to be the mark of God or a seal of God. It's going to be a mark of a beast instead. With that in mind, with that in mind, Brother Ron, this is why I think what you've experienced in life is so important because the whole system itself is much deeper than what people realize. 
Um, he is. When we look at, for example, even at some of the biblical things that we see, um, plainly scripturally, I, I see, like if you look at Ezekiel, and you see Ezekiel talk about the will and the will, you know, you can't help but wonder, what is he really talking about? Is it a spacecraft? Some people actually argue it's a spacecraft that he's talking about. Uh, Elijah is taken up in a chariot of fire. You know, was it a literal chariot of fire or was it something that just is the only way else to describe it? A chariot is a mode of transportation, but this was right. fiery, whatever took him off and went. Right. Um, you know, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so would it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Um, and it's not just the fact that they were marrying and given in marriage, which, by the way, that was the mingling of the seed, which we know has happened again uh, since the flood. But it's also technology. We get a little bit of the technology that speaks about in the Bible or in the book of Enoch, but nobody ever really gets the true technology that these uh, demonic entities, these fallen angels actually have. Right. Uh, and then the question comes in, you know, because, you know, granted, when Daniel was here, he had Gabriel, the angel was trying to get to him and he's fighting through a whole bunch of bad angels on the way here. That's right. So there's good and bad here in I would say, not technically in our own realm, but in a parallel realm, but getting to us is another issue there. So with that kind of setting the stage, Brother Ron, share, if you can, share with us whatever God lays upon your heart to share. Well, I guess what I'd start with is just go back to when the first time I really recall seeing a UFO and things like that, I was seven years old. And it woke me up at night. And I think we discussed that before. But after that, everywhere I went, like I'd walk through the orchards or anything like that. And I was always looking up wondering, you know, I wonder where I came from. And then the question kept coming into my mind is what we're seeing here on earth really what's here? I mean, is this real? Or are we just seeing this, you know? And why questions like that would come in a seven-year-old mind, you know, I don't have any idea. But I always wondered about things like that. And that's kind of what got everything started. But it also seemed like I kind of had a strong connection with Egypt. And I, I'm not sure why, but <clears throat> pardon me. Before when we uh, talked about this, I had told you about going to a pyramid. And uh, when I was in there and they were leading me, I never could look at who my leaders were or my guides, as you'd call them. Uh, I couldn't tell who they were or what they looked like or anything like that. But it seemed like they communicated telepathically or something. That way you always knew where to go and what, you know, what was happening. But when I got to this uh, area where the sarcophagus was at, uh, I mean, it was a beautiful sarcophagus. It was all painted and it looked just like the person inside. And when they removed it, it was a lady with really long black hair. She had a gold headband on and really dressed, uh, looked like a princess or something, you know. And all I could say at the time was, wow, you know, and they said that this was your wife. And I was like, huh? And they said something about in the past. And I always wondered about past lives. I don't know if we really have them. And there's not a lot of information for us to go to, you know, but it seemed as though they wanted me to know that before I left. But there was many times that I would get these recollections of walking in the desert, like in the sand is really hot, but you could see pyramids to the right and stuff where you were walking and things. And I thought, it, boy, that's fascinating. I wonder why I'm seeing that. But it's always like you recall things and then all at once they're there, you know, and you start, wow, I wonder what that's about, you know. So, but, Brother Ron, so when yeah. you... When you went to Egypt there, this was, 
did you feel like you were in a vision or did you feel like that you were actually carried away there by some kind of force? And I'm going to share something once you answer that, just to kind of make well, it simpler for people that are listening. Uh, actually, I, it was not a dream because I could actually feel things while I was there. Uh, for example, walking in this it's almost like a loamy soil inside the pyramid. You could feel it between your toes and things like that. You know, so I don't think you would do that in a dream. I'm not sure. Right. But right. I've never so, done it anyway. I don't know. <laughs> uh, let me say this, and this is for the sake of the people listening, Brother Ron, so they don't, you know, because some people might, <clears throat> it's just, that's like right over the top of their head. And those of you that have listened long enough and you've followed us, uh, you've listened to some of the intel information I've given, uh, we have a, a, a Navy SEAL. He's actually retired now. Uh, we call him Caesar. And uh, he was a very high-ranking officer in the Navy <clears throat> SEALs. And uh, he was over in Africa. Now, besides him telling this story, I've also had it confirmed by another good friend of mine in the intelligence community so I do know this from two different stories here. Uh, but anyway, Caesar, when he was over uh, in Africa, near in northern Africa, for that matter, uh, there was some tribal people there that kept coming up and they would say to uh, Americans that were there, American military, that uh, there are some alien entities that are wanting to meet with American soldiers. And uh, and people just thought they were kind of nuts, right? Well, finally, the U.S. sent in the uh, the uh, green, excuse me, not green braid, but the Navy SEALs, and uh, to to wait and see if they would come back in. Well, eventually they did. They came back in and they said they're wanting to meet with U.S. soldiers. At this point, the Navy SEALs go with these uh, local natives there. And they're walking off into the desert there. There are there are mountainous areas where they're at, uh, a lot of ravines and things. And once they got to a certain point, these entities come out. And uh, uh, they were kind of like what we might call a tall gray. They were not the small grays. They were more like the tall grays. And, uh, and so they spoke telepathically. And they told the the commander, which was Caesar, he was, we call him Caesar, it's not his real name, but uh, they told him to come with us and they did it by telepathic communication. Well, he would speak into his little microphone and near his mouth there uh, with his other guys, you know, look, this could be an ambush. We got to be careful. And every time he would relay a command to them, that one guy that was probably 50 feet in front of him he would speak telepathically back to him. He said, if we want to kill you, we would have already killed you. You do not need to tell your men. Don't be afraid. Right. right? So then they come up to where they're going into this ravine. He says, our leader wants to meet with you. They're coming up. They're getting ready to go into this ravine. And again, he warns his men. And again, the guy comes back or the alien comes back and he says, uh, I told you, if we wanted to kill you, you everyone would already be dead. He said, that's not what we're here for. So they come up to this one huge uh, canyon wall rock. And he said, our leader is in here. Your men need to stay. You can come with us inside of here. And he's looking at this solid rock and it's like, okay, well, let's see what happens. And the aliens just stepped right through the rock as if it wasn't even there. Right. And Caesar said him and one other of his guys they stepped as if they're going to walk right into the rock. And he said, and sure enough, they went right through that rock as if it wasn't there. And on the other side was just like a, a big cavern. And it was like being in another world almost. And he said they met with the leader of their guys there. And they told them there that there was coming some very bad things coming on the earth in the very near future where the reptilians and some of their entities, their cousins were going to come to earth and they'd be coming out of the earth. And they're going to be facing a battle on this earth like they never saw before. Now, the whole purpose really of going into this is just to confirm what you're saying. And then you have Brother Gary Lowry, who's been on here with us before as well. He is a, like yourself, he's a Christian. 
and he has been him and his family has been abducted more than one time. My wife's own brother, Alex, uh, was abducted several times. Uh, Yana herself has seen a spacecraft within, she said, within 100 yards of standing near it, uh, shaped like a cigar. And she held her peace most of her life because she was afraid people would think she's crazy. So, and I know you've said the same to me, Brother Ron, you're afraid that people will think you're nuts, you know? And I'm uh, about not to care. <laughs> exactly, right? So, and even, listen, and I'll tell you something too, because you mentioned it's like, uh, like a former life or something. Just for our, the brothers and sisters that would listen to this, don't be judgmental. One thing, let me explain to you. That is very much still believed amongst the Jewish people today of reincarnation. They get that mainly. I mean, my theory on it is I know it's written in Talmud. I do not believe in Talmud, but I think they get the idea, Brother Ron and friends that are listening. I think they get it from like uh, the case of Elijah and Elisha. Of course, that wouldn't be a reincarnation because Elisha was still alive <laughs> when Elijah goes up, right? But um, even in the early church fathers, there was some beliefs in certain circles because of John the Baptist, for example, yeah. uh, you know, and, and so I don't normally go down that road. I like to listen to it, but, uh, you know, I'm open-minded to hear things, but, you know, I don't take a doctrinal view on it, but I just want to share with some people, you know, they're, especially with John the Baptist, right? You know, right. because Jesus said, if you can receive it, that was the way it's interesting. He says to his disciples, if you can receive it. Right. This was the Elijah that was for to for to a come. I mean, what what is that about, right? So, but anyway, we'll just leave it like that there. But I just want people to realize when you're saying these things, don't take it as anything strange. There are a lot of things written in the scriptures that we don't can't quite figure out yet either. So, anyway, go ahead, brother. Well, Brother Steve, I'll tell you what, I've had people tell me you can't believe in God and have this stuff happen and believe that. And that's absolutely not true because I've always believed in God, even when I was small. I mean, that's, I just knew he was Amen. there, you know. Amen. Gary's and, the same way, exact same way. He's still a firm believer and it's never moved him on that at all. And he said, in fact, the weird thing is, he said the entities that took him and his family they spoke about uh, God as well. He said, right. and they, he said the one thing that struck him, they said, they told him one time, they said, look, and Yana interviewed him. It's on our channel somewhere back there. Gary said, they said, look, we know we made mistakes and we're sorry for what we did. Now that makes me think the ones that took him are part of the fallen angels. Uh, so I'll just leave it like that there. But go ahead, brother. I don't want to interrupt you no more. I'm just trying to oh, soften fine. the stage for people that are listening. Uh, the things you bring up is even, it just reinforces things that I've seen and believe. Uh, to me, the greater the God, the greater the creations, the broader the spectrum, you know, I mean, all of it, because he is the one true God. So, you know, that part, I don't have a problem with so uh but anyway on this egyptian thing uh it seemed like i kept seeing symbols every morning when i'd wake up kind of almost like a a vision on the wall and it lasts about five minutes and i don't know if i'm able to read those hieroglyphics or not i'm not physically aware of it but i have looked up some of them the ankh was a symbol of life and the other one they kept showing all the time, it looked like the top of the Ankh, if you're familiar with that. And then it had a bar in the middle with two ribbons, but it's made out of stone. And I looked and looked and I finally found it and it says protected. That's all it says. Wow. Protected. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, maybe it's me. I hope so, you know. <laughs> Yeah. That's, that's the reason I say, wow, because it makes me feel better, you know, because truly by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are protected. So amen. Yeah. Right. Amen. Amen. Well, Brother uh, Ron, can you describe, um, you know, the beings that you went with? What did they look like? Uh, well, there's been different ones, brother. Uh, sure. One 
ones that wanted me to go on the ship with them and they were showing me how the ship maneuvered and they wanted me to sit in, I guess, like the pilot seat and it had a handprint that you put your hand in and whichever way you tilted your hand and that's the way the ship would go, they wanted me to try it. Then they said, if you concentrate, you can move it with your mind. And I did not, I never did try that, that I recall, but they were showing me all inside their panels. And I was an electronics engineer, of course, I, that may be why they were showing me, I don't know, but it was interesting because some of the things they had in there, I had no idea what it was. And they were trying to explain how the, you know, how it all worked, but on everything, everyone, ever, the, all they kept saying was, you have to be ready. And I still, to this day, I'm not sure what Forbes is like. I was given an assignment or something, and I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, this past Monday, July the 1st, when I got up, it's almost like you stop in a trance or something like that, and I just heard the voice in my head say, the time is near. Amen. And Amen. I do believe that. I'm not sure which time, but I know something's about to happen from all the things, you know, that's in the scriptures and things like that. So, And, but, and Brother Ron, I, I want to just say this because, you know, you got all kinds of people that listen, that, that, that tune in, things like that. <clears throat> but... You know, you have a nice southern draw from the south, without a doubt. But you also, you have, like you said, you 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 were an engineer, you know, and you've got, if it's not considered a genius IQ, it's near a genius IQ, because I know your IQ and my wife's IQ are almost exactly the same. Um, you know, because I, if I remember right one time we were talking about that, and I think you told me it's like 142 IQ, something of that effect. Is that right? Well, I was an aircraft engineer at TWA, and they required all these tests for what your personality would fit, what your capabilities are, what your IQ is, you know, your what your ability to learn was and all that. And the IQ came up at 142. And I should have been a CEO of a executive of a company. And my boss didn't care much for that outcome. But <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and Yana was 146 when she was uh when she was she was actually tested by uh the medical school in Prague. She came over, uh she had she was real anemic, and they ended up having to put her in the hospital in Prague wow. uh years and years ago, back when she was just about 16. Uh, and they saw, though, because she's in the hospital for so long, uh, the uh, the head of the hospital there, because also the, the university medical school is the same location, uh, they noticed that she had a real interest in medicine. Uh, they ended up testing her IQ, and she was 146. And at that point, until she had to go back home, the uh, the dean of the university uh, said to Yana, you know, look, we would love for you to attend uh, the classes with our medical students here. Uh, we know, you know, that you're going to graduate in about a year or so if you're in, and we want to bring you into med school. Uh, so that's how we found out what her IQ was, or at least she had found out herself. So, you know, I, I, and I don't even, I, I don't want to have mine tested. I don't even want to know. <laughs> well, I had mine tested one time and it came back negative. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid that's about what mine would be. Uh, I don't know. This guy doesn't exist. So, but you know, Brother Ron, too, in in talking with you, though, one thing, and and I and I don't know how far you want to go down this rabbit hole here, but uh, uh, even if you just skim the surface, it really made me think a lot on a on a level I never thought before, and that is because you've been you've been taken away more than once. And obviously the government has also figured out that somebody's picking you up. Yeah. And uh, can you share a little bit about that information as well? Well, during this time, while that was happening, uh, the heavy part of it was in 1993, about mid year. 
and I lived on right on a four lane street in Kansas City. And I got to notice the Air Force car was parked across the road down the street, oh, two or three hundred feet probably. And I got to watch and see what they were doing. I thought, I wonder why they're parked there. And they'd get out and they were wearing their dress uniforms and it was the Air Force. And uh, I thought, well, for a little bit, I'd just go down there. So I went out. We always drove from the backside because that's where the street was. Hard to get out on that four lane. And uh, I went back there and there was another Air Force car parked back there right down below my driveway. And when I come out, I stood there and looked down the street. So they drove and went around the block. And about, oh, 30 minutes to an hour later, a black helicopter came over uh, with no markings. And I'm in aircraft, so I mean, I know they're supposed to, where the markings are. And uh, there was nothing on it, just kind of a flat black. That was it. And had guys sitting out of both sides of it. And they flew right over the house. And I looked up, so I got my camera, and they turned around and come back. <laughs> so I guess I wasn't supposed to take pictures. I don't know. But uh, that went on for several days. And all of a sudden, they picked me up and took me to, I think it's an Air Force base, because everybody there had the dress uniforms on. And some pretty high officials were there one wearing a really bright blue tie but anyway uh he came over to me and he said uh you don't really need to be afraid but we've got to know what you know and why you know it and i'm okay you know and they took me down these steps, and it had the pipes on the stairway. I've been in a lot of government facilities, so I, I, that's what it was. But they took me down there, and things started happening that I couldn't tell you what was. But right at it, it was a big flash, like a white light just flashed. And I don't know what happened after that, you know. And here's here's what's interesting when you say that, brother Ron. And I want to I'm going to clarify a couple of things for those people that are listening as well. Um, you know that uh, when you what you're what you've experienced even there, one it lets me know because there's two parts of the U.S. government. One part, a secret part, actually works with entities. They know what's going on, but even in the ranking officers that know about that program, it is such a minority, it's not even funny. So you could be on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, for example, and probably nobody on the Joint Chiefs knows about the secret alien entities that work with the government. Uh, but then there's a side of the military that is monitoring, they see the activity, they know the activity is going on, they cannot, it cannot be published or anything like that, but they're trying to figure out what's going on. And then obviously with you getting picked up, you came across the radar somewhere along the way. And then of course, them knowing your background, you being an engineer and everything. Now you've got the government wondering what in the world are these entities that are picking <laughs> him up? What does he know, et cetera. But when you talk about this coming out and this light flashing, um, you know, what really got me to thinking on that right there uh, was that um, that reminded me of the Men in Black movie where they flash their little pin, the light. Oh, and yeah. Erases the memory, right? Well, yeah. here's what's interesting, Brother Ron. That exists, right? Uh, people I know that, that know these things, they... But here's the thing, they, the, the alien entities share that technology with the Americans, and we actually have that technology, and they can erase your memory, but it doesn't take on everybody. Uh, and that's what's fascinating. So that's exactly what the, the attempt was, was to kind of black out what you saw, heard, and seen, things like that. They didn't want you to remember 
uh, any guys in suits, especially with blue ties and things like that. No doubt an official much more advanced than that of the men in black, I would say, too. But that's just fascinating to see, uh, because when I heard your story, I'd never thought about the fact that we've got, I mean, I know the fact about how you got one part of the government that doesn't know, but yet they're trying to find out, right? Right. And of course, some of those guys that wear a certain color ties and everything, they're part of that group that want to know, but they just can't seem to ever find out. So there's anyway, a secret what, part a lot of them don't know about. So, you know. Exactly. Exactly. Who was it? Was it um uh president uh was it Hoover uh that actually made the agreement with the ETs to be able to abduct Americans? Did you know about that one there? Yeah, it wasn't Hoover though, was it? Uh, no, it wasn't Hoover. I've got the wrong name on that. Um, Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower. That's who it was. And he's the one that really got things rolling on that, I think. Yeah, they, but, it, supposedly the it went south. They he made an agreement with them that they could abduct so many Americans per year, but they're to return them. And in some cases, they didn't get returned. I don't know if they became dinner or not, but they didn't get returned. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, his granddaughter uh, has agreed to come on our program before. I just never have gotten it fully arranged to be able to get her on here yet. But uh, I'd like to know more about what she has to know as well. But, right. but people like yourself, though, Brother Ron, You've got that inside information and some of the things that you share with me, I know we're not even scratching the surface on, <laughs> is off the charts. So yeah. what, what else do you feel led to speak about? Well, at one point, uh, one evening I had to go and they said we were going to go, I think they called it interdimensionally and they wanted me to meet my family that I had on that side. And as it was flying in, I don't know if we were on a saucer or what type of vehicle, but it was coming in at a right bank and you could see below and it was populated like the earth would be, but it was more futuristic. Like the houses had more like don't, some of them looked like saucers that were stacked that had housing in them, you know, and that's where we went to one of those. And they told me, they introduced me to this lady and a little boy and a little girl around, I'd say 10, 11 years old, somewhere along in there and said that this is your wife and your son and daughter in this world here. And I, wow. <laughs> you know? Well, now here's the funny thing though, right? You know, is and I'm sure like you know even when you told me about this initially it was like you don't even know what to think about it you know it's like what yeah. in the world is this all about right and I'm sure some people listening would be like you know well that's just crazy that can't happen but you yeah. know the odd thing is before you ever said that and I've actually told people that are listening right now that there's thousands of people that have heard me talk about this before including you brother Ron right uh, and that is when I used to talk with uh, my contact and uh, uh, one of my contacts that I have there, I was told at one point, one time that, that, that CERN, you know, and we're talking about like, you know, Harold, uh, the scientist over in Europe, uh, that CERN, that they've learned with CERN that we have parallel universes. They know that there's at least eight that they've just been able to get into. Uh, they believe there's up as many as 12, but they're not for sure yet. But in three of those parallel universes, they said there was a world in every one of those, just like what's here on Earth. Right. And the strangest thing they said to me that just I, I couldn't even wrap my head around it, but it's exactly what you're saying here. They said there is another you on that other earth so to speak living another life than what you're living here and it's now, a different time period right and one one of them they said that it was like the 1950s 
on one that they went to. And they didn't tell me about the third one, but there's a third one. And they said, and I and I and I said, are you serious? I said, like, so and, they, and I actually used the expression. I said, so Donald Trump is living a life in that other world. I said, well, do they know if he is like if it's 1950, is he is the age he would have been uh, in 1950 back then, like a, a little boy or, or a young That's man a or something like that? Yeah. Um, and and the scientist told me, he says, I really have no idea. He said that he said I he said I probably should have asked that question, but I never asked that question. Um so <laughs> now granted in all my writings I've ever read, I've never read that particular thing there before, but it's just interesting you share that, and yet I've heard that before. Um right. so, well, you were talking about the dimensions, they told me there was eleven that had other worlds and people living in them like that. And I don't know if that's true or not. That's what they told me. And the people that on that one ship uh, looked a little bit like the grays, but they were different. And on their foreheads up on top, it had white spots all over it. And I had never seen that before. Wow. And another group was the Palladians. And I guess from what they told me, they came from, uh, it's called the Seven Virgins, and it's near the Orion Belt and the Orion part of the galaxy there. And I thought that was pretty interesting. Some of them were tall, and some of them were, you know, down around my height. And from what I've heard from you and other people, that the younger ones are shorter, like, I guess, like our kids would be. But... Uh, the ones that I dealt with, none of them had gotten real tall. There was a couple a little taller than me, but you know, nothing exceptional. Right, right. And that's that, and that's what I'd heard too. Is that, uh, and they uh, they never told me the age, but they said normally when they they intermingle with humans, it's the younger uh, people. But too, you're talking about entities that live to be 800 years old, so. Right. <laughs> are, are the youngsters 50 years old to us, you know, that type thing? Who knows? Uh, I don't know. Right, but, and, and of course, I've always heard that the Palladians are those that are the leaders of all, you know, of the of the Federation, things like that. And, and I know that. It, right. As Christians listen to this, it's like, what? You know, uh, take it however you want to take it. But the thing is, is there's so much more that's going on than what we realize. And we typically, when we read, like, for example, the uh, you read about the watchers, you read about the, uh, the, the, you know, the angels that come down on earth when, when man was here during the times of Noah. Um, there's a lot of things that we don't really know. In fact, if you read from the Dead Sea Scrolls, we get even more interesting information there um that's very similar to like what you would read in Enoch where some things that we read about in Enoch it seems like oh wow that's like that just seems too far out right but actually in the Dead Sea Scrolls which is are the canonized versions of that there are clearly uh writings there that really can make you wonder what's out there beyond what we what we really know uh, and then, you know, too, when people sit there and they think, oh, gosh, this stuff can't be. Oh, my goodness. You're talking about the beast that's coming. You're talking about uh, angels <laughs> with four heads and things like that. I mean, we read things like that. and We don't. Oh, that's no big deal. You know, uh, or, or Leviathan. He's got seven heads, you know, the dragon in the sea. You know, is all this metaphorical. Well, according to the scripture, it's not very metaphorical. It's actually very real. Right. And I'm afraid that reality is going to set in. A lot of people are going to see things that'll probably scare them to death. You know, well, there you but, go again, brother Ron, as the scripture says, there are fearful sights coming up on the earth that will cause man's hearts to fail. That's true. Fear. That's you true. Know? So if that's going to happen, you know, what in the world's coming up on this earth? I, I don't know. <laughs> so but, I think uh, when you get some, get, get like experiences like what you've had, Brother Ron, and, and others have had, um, 
you've probably had just talking to you privately a lot deeper than most people I've ever met before. And, um, and I, and we'll save some of that maybe for another day, depending on how, how God leads you and what you feel like saying. Um, but the thing is, is what's remarkable is that you're unshaken and you un, unmoving in your faith in Jesus Christ, regardless of the things that you've experienced. Well, um, I'm not going to remove that. Amen. Amen. And I appreciate that so much too about you. So any, any closing comments, brother? Well, all the ones that I've met, I've heard people, you know, give horror stories of what they did to them and how mean they were and all that. And I have not experienced anything like that. But some of the things that I've been told is I'm never alone and not to worry about it and that I'm protected. And I hope that that is. And that may be why I kept seeing that one Egyptian symbol there that says protection. You know, I don't know if that's what that means or not, but I hope I am. And I know through Jesus Christ, we're all protected anyway. We're good. You know, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, brother Ron. God bless you for coming on with us this evening. Uh, and uh, if somebody would want to be able to reach out to you, is there a way for people to reach out to you, brother Ron? Well, they can reach me, I guess. Uh, I have, well, I'll just give them an email of ronguntor at gmail.com if they need to write or anything like that. That'd be fine. Hey, Amen. I mean, you're I'm, open to, I'm open to questions and things like that, but every but time I'm thinking I more specifically, if someone wants to be able to interview you, uh, the Scotta platform out there, uh, that they can reach you there. So we'll put that in the description for them, Brother Ron. And, uh, that would like to be able to, to, to bring you on their programs for you to be able to share uh, this information okay. with their audience. So All right. sounds great. Thank you, brother Ron. God bless you, brother. Thank you guys God for listening. Uh, Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live, and, and we'll have Ron's email address there for you in the description below. Good evening. Uh-oh.